Um, I'm aware that this is the last session on what feels like a very long day. And I'm still not even sure what day it is, but I believe it's Monday. Uh, and we do have, um, well, at least half the audience wants to go back and get changed for the Carla dinner, um, that being the female half, and my colleague Mikel, and possibly Carl, who are in shorts. <laughs> so um, I have, um, I've put together here, a, um, I think what I called it a special organised session. So this is one of the requests, a slight uh, variation on the way that I hear has been run before. Um, so I don't even know if my name's in the book, so I should introduce myself. I'm Paula Logali from the Office of Health Economics. And so this session was kind of a, um, what we did is we, we put together a kind of a description of papers that we would like people to address an issue. And the issue was um, cost effectiveness thresholds. Interestingly, we didn't get one from Carl, but we got five very interesting papers, which I think are all along this kind of um, paradigm of where are we now and, and I guess where are we going. So I hope what we've got is five papers, well I know we've got five papers, I hope what we've got is five interesting papers that look along that spectrum and, um, and we, have, we have a little bit more of a kind of interest in, and an understanding of where we are in different places, in different countries, different healthcare systems and different funding models as to um, what we're doing with cost effectiveness thresholds. So the way that I'm going to play it is that everybody has 12 minutes. I will tell them two minutes before they finish to finish. I will stand up if they haven't finished at 12 minutes. Um, and then we'll have a couple of minutes for questions or clarification on each paper. And then at the end of the all five, we'll then have a chance to have a discussion and some talk with, with each. And we'll hopefully try to bring them all in and see how, you know, where we actually are going as a discipline, how we're going forward. So the first presenter, according to the book, which is not necessarily the one in the app, but I'm going off this, is uh, Shoko. Okay, today we have results up to 2016 instead of 2014 as shown in your program. We increased our sample size and we were able to capture the most recent data from the US, UK, Canada and Australia. When we conduct economic evaluation, we always take this into account inflation, discount rate, and price year, etc. But when it comes to cost effectiveness threshold, we don't do any of those. And we report results as if 50,000 is 50,000, wherever we are, whenever it is. So we wanted to see how the authors of cost utility analysis report this issue in recent uh, years. Our study objectives is twofold. The first, compare the cost of the threshold used in cost utility analysis by countries, publication years, and therapeutic areas, and to understand the commonly used cost of the threshold in today's monetary values and discuss the implication of using them as a decision rule without updating over time. We used electronic databases and we included articles published in English peer-reviewed journals and if it reported cost per quality and, and if it has full text in PDF form and published in the last 10 years. And the countries we selected are the US, Canada, UK and Australia. We exclusively the abstract only papers, editorial opinion review. And we present our results as a nominal values and also in today's dollars. And we convert it to 2016 US dollars across countries and years adjusted for inflation and purchasing power. Now purchasing power takes care of the price differences between countries which cannot be addressed by just using exchange rate conversion. 
We also compared our um, threshold by disease group, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and NIDA. This is how we selected our articles. We first, we first used search terms, cost effective, cost utility, cost benefit, and benefit cost. And then after removing duplicates and selected, uh, limited to the papers with PDF full text, and also with any mention of willingness, willingness to pay or quality. And then we started to find into four countries, US, UK, Canada, Australia, and informed by the sample size formula for a population mean, which is on the left side of the slide, and it gives us 15 articles per country per year. And that gives us total sample size of 660, however, uh, we were able to reach the target for the UK 100%. As you can see, 15 per, per, uh, per country per year, and we have 11 years, so 165 is 100%. But for the US, uh, in the earlier years, 2000, uh, in earlier years, we had some issue in finding uh, up to 15, but still 97% complete. For Canada and Australia, uh, unfortunately, we didn't reach that the level. Uh, so the final uh, sample size was uh, 444. So 444 articles were included in the analysis. So here's the results. We need to pay threshold selected by authors. Uh, in the US, it didn't change uh, significantly over, over years and is some fluctuation between 50,000 and 100,000, and in Canada is a similar trend. In the UK, it's more, uh, more flat, There's either 30K or 20K pounds. In Australia, 50K and 64. Now, 64K is an interesting one. Uh, it's coming from the recent, uh, recent paper on international survey by Shiroiwa in Japan. So some researchers are starting to use those unconventional uh, threshold. Now, I, I normally work in a cardiovascular research area, and it grabbed my attention in 2014 when American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association released a statement on cost slash value methodologies. And in it, it says, time has come to include cost effectiveness assessment in clinical practice guidelines. And then in there, they show this uh, threshold categories. It is based on the WHO who choice, and high value is clearly defined as less than 50,000, and then 150,000 is also used as a cutoff. Now, it's not only cardiovascular disease area, but also Oncology Society also published some uh, position statement, such as NCCN and ASCO. They also uh, provided some uh, guidance on cost effectiveness analysis. So we thought that uh, 2014 uh, is an interesting cutoff time to compare if there's any notable change in the use of therapeutic uh, use of the uh, value categories over time. So first in the US, before 2014, 42% of the articles included in the analysis used the lowest threshold category, 50,000. And then that went up uh, by 12% after 2014. And then the second lowest category, 50 to, uh, 50K to 100K, it went down a little bit. Now similar, so there might be some increased use of lower threshold category, some downward push towards the lowest category. And then similar trend was, was observed for Canada as well. So the lowest category went up by uh, 12% and the second lowest one went down uh, 19%. Now UK, uh, the same, 10% uh, up, and then 4% uh, down for the second lowest one. Australia, similar uh, trend, although the sample size was very small here. 
So, so overall, there seemed to be some downward trend, although numerical, we didn't do any uh, inferential statistics here. But if the downward trend is indeed true with nominal values, then, then when it's converted to today's dollar value, it will be even more uh, pronounced. So this is what it looks like. Here, the uh, purchasing power parity converted so the, all the local currencies are converted to the US dollar 2016. And except Australia, the, all the other countries seem to have a downward trend over time. And it's in a way expected because uh, the value of a dollar today is much less than it was in the past. Here's a disease category comparison. So a quality in cancer is more uh, values than the other category, although, uh, again, numerically, there's no inferential statistics was there. So what's the implication of using this threshold without updating over time? So this is one scenario. Here's a relationship between quality and the cost. And so say 10 years ago, to purchase high value, the high value category that cost 49,000 per quality, and that's, that's the same as 58,000 today. Now, if you're operating the same uh, therapeutic area and looking at the same patient group and trying to produce the same high value outcome in a better treated population, it's harder because, because of the law of diminished marginal uh, quality. So, Put it differently, the, the upper part is the diminished marginal quality, and then at the same time, cost, if you keep using the threshold as a fixed, outdated, and unadjusted, then, then the cost gap between those two forces becomes larger and makes it harder to harder for a new intervention to get funded on a cost effectiveness basis and also underestimates the cost of providing the same value to a current population. Now, study limitations, the country selection was limited and the sample size, uh, the UK and US reached the targeted uh, 15 per, per country per year, but not for Canada and Australia. An article without full text were not included, however, uh, none of these are likely to have systematically overestimated or underestimated the thresholds selected by the authors in the article we included. So in conclusion, the price of a quality did not increase significantly over time in all those four countries we looked at. And there might be possible downward trends, uh, in other words, increased use of a lower threshold categories over time. And that, that trend would be even more pronounced if it's uh, seen in trend, today's dollar values. And quality in cancer may be more uh, highly valued, albeit out of small sample size. Uh, in closing, uh, in 2003, Dr. Peter Uville mentioned this, the state, the cost effectiveness threshold is dynamic and must change over time, but the result, our results did not confirm this is happening. And instead, these multipliers of five were very popular uh, still. At the same time, it's worth mentioning that some new values, such as one on mine or one eight three, these are coming from uh, Wayne, Dr. Weinstein and the uh, Bracewaite paper, and also Dr. Sh uh, Shai Wan and his colleague that uh, Australian dollars 64K was coming from that paper. So cost-effectiveness community researchers are, are willing to use new values rather than just 50K or 100K. And then finally, uh, some authors were reluctant to use external uh, predetermined values. So they use their own ICUR, for example, our, our intervention is cost-effective if a decision maker is willing to pay $22,202 per quality. So something like that, they use their own ICUR without referring to any external number. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you for having me, and back to you, Chair.
So I'm hoping this is working. Um, so just uh, two or three minutes for some points for clarification and talk before we go to the end. So Carl. You described the threshold values that authors put in their papers as fixed and outdated and unadjusted. I mean, more importantly, they're not evidence-based and they reflect nothing about the evidence of what the health opportunity costs actually are in the healthcare systems for which they're publishing their papers. Um, we do need uh, evidence and we do need estimates that are updated as evidence evolves and we increasingly have that evidence and some of the evidence in the UK was presented yesterday. We've got 10 waves of data and what that shows is that the cost per quality that our NHS delivers has been flat for 10 years in nominal terms. It's declined in real terms. What does that mean? Does it mean it's harder to generate a quality? No, it means exactly the opposite. It means our healthcare system is getting better at delivering health with the resources devoted to it. What it does mean is that new technologies which claim high prices are gonna to have to jump a higher hurdle because the alternative use of those resources generates more health for more people. So I think that's what we need. We need to move away from opinion and policy-based speculation about how much we can afford to pay for equality and we need to move to an evidence-based assessment of what our healthcare systems deliver and how that evolves over time. And the truth is, the evidence in the UK at least, is we get better and better and better at improving health and that provides a higher and higher hurdle for those people who have a temporary monopoly on branded pharmaceuticals. Sorry, Carl, was there a question in there? <laughs> <laughs> I take it as comment. There is a question, I'm used to this. I was involved in student politics and I tried to smash the state for at least 10 years. It's very easy, you just add the phrase, is it not a fact? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's unfortunate that your session was yesterday, but I believe it was filmed and so we can watch that. <laughs> I actually have a question, which actually you did it, you say this, and, and this, this is a notion between the willingness to pay approach to the threshold and the opportunity cost. So your focus of your uh, search was on willingness to pay. Do you think you missed any papers by using, if you use the term opportunity cost? So, you, is it? so, did you, so your search term was willingness to pay. So one of your search terms was willingness to pay. Yep. Have you missed any papers by excluding the search term, the opportunity cost? It is possible. It is possible, and sometimes the uh, articles may not use particularly willingness to pay or more different way of expressing the same notion. So it, yes, it is possible. That's okay. one of the limitations, yes. Mm. All right, okay. Thank you very much. The next we have uh, Melanie who's gonna be talking about WHO and, and uh, thresholds. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for staying for the last session on a Monday when you do have pretty dresses to go and put on or nice suits. Um, I work at WHO in the Department of Health Systems Governance and Financing in a team called Economic Analysis and Evaluation, and that's where the WHO Choice Program is nested, and I'm sure that many people within the room are familiar with WHO Choice, and one of the things that you're probably most familiar with is our GDP-based thresholds. So I'm going to talk a bit about a paper that we published um, just towards the end of last year and um, where those GDP-based thresholds came from, what they should and should not be used for. Uh, and just to say my co-author Jeremy Lauer is in the room back here as well, um, and the rest of my team. Um, so if there's any particular questions that he should answer instead of me at the end, I'll throw them to him. Um, I just want to be really clear about which thresholds we're talking about. So I separate them in my mind into demand side and supply side. So on the demand side, we've got the th thresholds of the societal willingness to pay values. And I think Lisa Robinson gave an excellent presentation on this type of threshold yesterday uh, as part of Carl's session, so hopefully also recorded for those who missed it. And then we've got the supply side decision-making thresholds, and these are around the opportunity cost. And I think we have a bit of an issue with conflating the two and mixing what we're talking about sometimes. So I am gonna start by talking about 
willingness to pay thresholds, and then segue into decision-making thresholds. So some of you may be familiar with the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health that was held in 2000 and 2001 and was a WHO commission. This is a quote from the commission report to WHO. And it says, one goal of economic analysis is to convert disease-induced losses into dollar terms in order to assess the economic benefits that would accrue to reducing the disease burden. The economics literature on the value of a life has a strong and consistent conclusion. The value of an extra year of life as a result of successfully treating a disease, for example, is worth considerably more than the extra market income that will be earned in that year. According to some estimates, each life year is valued at around three times the annual earnings. So if you picked up a couple of numbers in there, it would be the extra market income that will be earned in a year, and then three times the annual earning. So from those, you might see a segue to how WHO Choice came to reference one and three times GDP per capita as willingness to pay thresholds. Lisa's done a much better job than I have of tracking exactly where these data came from, and I'll show you the reference to her paper at the end. Um, so the GDP-based thresholds that are referenced within WHO Choice's global normative cost-effectiveness estimates arise from this quote from the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health. They're a demand size measure, side measure of the consumption value an individual is willing to give up for the addition of a healthy year of life. We use them to indicate at a global normative level what interventions might be interesting in a country and which ones are unlikely to be interesting. So they're really indicative global norms. The most well-known example of their use is in the Appendix 3 of the Global Action Plan for Non-Communicable Diseases, which is the list of NCD best buys. Um, but what's important to note is that the best buys didn't only rely on cost effectiveness, they did bring in other criteria. WHO choices never suggested that one or three times GDP per capita are a decision-making threshold to be used in countries. And this is something that we want the health economics community to be really aware of and really clear about. One and three times GDP per capita, they're global norms, they're indicative, they're not specific to any country. And if countries start to use them as decision-making thresholds or price negotiation points, even worse, we can run into a situation where we're just not making the right choices based on economic evidence. So if, if we can do one thing at this conference, what we'd really like the health economics community to take away is that these aren't decision-making thresholds and we would really be uncomfortable with countries suggesting that they are or any health e economist in a country promoting their use as decision-making thresholds. WHO Choice uses an approach to cost effectiveness that does um, look at whole packages of healthcare interventions. So we're interested in health maximisation and combinations of interventions that lead to maximising health, but we don't develop a um, package of interventions based on a threshold. We develop them based on health maximisation. So we want to look at what's the most cost-effective option in a country, what's the next most cost-effective, and keep adding interventions on until we reach some kind of budget threshold. Now, at that point, maybe we can work out an implied cost-effectiveness threshold, but we are really interested in health maximisation. So to move on to decision-making and decision-making thresholds, when we are working with countries, we really promote that there's three steps involved in decision making in a country. There's data and analysis, there's a dialogue, and then there's a decision. A lot of what we do as health economists fits into this data section. That's where cost effectiveness goes. And the data, it's got a red line around it because it really should be firewalled off from any political negotiation that goes on. So within our little data bubble, we can have thresholds that lead to what we suggest, but we can't generally enforce that those kind of thresholds are used in a decision-making process that happens at a political level. Some countries do have a legal framework in place that does enforce uh, the results of an HTA mechanism to be used, and that HTA mechanism may use a threshold to make their recommendations, but that's actually very uncommon. 
So WHO does inform a lot of priority setting and policy making, and it doesn't always have cost effectiveness in it, and traditionally it hasn't had. This is increasing as we um, move along, and in, uh, in the next couple of years there will be, you know, guidance within the guideline review committee on how to incorporate economic evidence into this process. So we generally work with, um, you know, the evidence of effect, bal balance of benefits and harms, values and preferences, economic information and fairness considerations. So cost effectiveness can come in, budget impact can come in, but there's a lot of other criteria to be considered. And, you know, health economics is really fighting on a global stage in a lot of countries. We're fighting to get our little foothold and prove the value of efficiency um, and uh, this opportunity cost health maximisation approach. We're not always there in a lot of the countries that we work in. So there's a number of different, you know, frameworks that have been set up. I think there was a session yesterday on um, multi-criteria decision analysis and value frameworks. So, you know, there's a lot of work going on in this area. Translating that kind of thing into country-led processes is really complex. So I want to give a couple of examples of where we've seen thresholds used or cost effectiveness results used um, potentially not very well to promote decisions. So this is an example of a country that did a WHO choice contextualisation. So they analysed breast cancer cost effectiveness of trastuzumab in Peru and they said as part of a treatment package, trastuzumab could be a cost effective option when using the demand side willingness to pay thresholds. Now, that's very nice, and it's nice in a um, journal publication, but when going and doing the budget impact analysis, what would actually happen is that the whole breast cancer current budget would be subsumed by this one drug. And that's not necessarily the right choice to make. So, you know, taking a, a cost effectiveness, piece of cost effectiveness information from a publication, when it's not linked to the local decision-making opportunity cost threshold, it doesn't help with the policy dialogue. This is an example of tracking um, cost effectiveness ratios as a percentage of GDP per capita and whether programs were implemented or not implemented. So this was done by a colleague working in vaccine, um, Raymond Hudebessi, who's also a co-author of our paper on thresholds. And what they found was that um, for HPV vaccine, there was some kind of link between the cost effectiveness and the implementation of a program. So in case you can't see it well, the light grey line represents a cost effectiveness result and the, the dark black line represents when the vaccination program has been implemented. So the program was more likely to be implemented when the cost effectiveness was less than two times GDP per capita. But even if it was less than 50% of GDP per capita, that didn't guarantee implementation. So cost effectiveness is not necessarily the only criteria decision makers are using. And then finally, in um, a country that we worked with on developing the NCD action plan, one of the interventions promoted by WHO within its package of essential non-communicable disease interventions is, um, is uh, asthma and COPD treatment. And so this country said, well, we want to scale that up. We want to scale it up to hit 50% coverage by 2020, which is coming from a um, current coverage of 2%. That was an extremely rapid scale up, and it actually subsumed their entire NCD budget. And we went and had a look into it, and we found that the price that they were paying for the drugs that they needed was so far above the global average that using a, a general global cost effectiveness ratio didn't help them to make any kind of decision because what they really needed to do was go and negotiate the price and get a better deal. So in conclusion, what we suggest is don't focus just on the threshold. Look at your whole benefit package, particularly when you're in a setting that's not the UK, where you don't know if your current package is efficient and, if, and what your opportunity cost is of adding something new. We need a country-specific process where evidence is considered in the decision-making process and it's supported by legislation and has stakeholder buy-in and transparency. The UK is lucky to already have that. There's a lot of countries of the world that don't. And we need to use cost effectiveness alongside other criteria that are also important. Maybe us health economists don't think that the other criteria are as important, but every country has its own values and we need to be respectful of that and let countries develop their own value framework for decision making.
So just to refer you on to the papers that I referenced, the one on WHO thresholds was in WHO bulletin towards the end of last year, and uh, Lisa's paper on the one and three times GDP per capita uh, was in health policy and planning earlier this year. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Melly. Again, have we got some uh, quick questions, clarification points from anybody? Carl? <laughs> is it, bring is it, it on. Is it a question? Is it a question? It's always a question? Does it have a question mark at the end of the sentence? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just... Just to say, I thought that was excellent, uh, and I, I agree with everything. Uh, and I, I think it's really important to recognise that having some understanding, some empirical understanding of what health opportunity costs might be in a particular healthcare system, or indeed having some better understanding of what the consumption value of health might be in a particular context, neither of those things are the whole story. It's absolutely right. We need to look at the other things we are currently doing I think having an understanding of health opportunity cost, as the system currently is, helps us do that, helps us through an iterative process of asking the question, are there things we're currently investing in that are worse than this? And if they are, is there a case for disinvestment? There may or may not be, there may be many political and other reasons why we don't want to disinvest. But having that is, uh, is, is, is an important, but not the whole part of the story, and we need to think about the system as a whole, so for sure. Is it not a fact? <laughs> I can answer that question. I think we're completely on the same page. We need to understand the opportunity cost of what we're spending. We don't want to crowd out a, um, you know, a good value for money option by investing in a bad value for money option. In a lot of countries, we don't have the data to know the story, but I think there's, there's a lot of different groups trying to work towards that. Once we know the average opportunity cost of what we're currently buying, we then need to look at if the current expenditure is efficient and where we can make savings, because there's a lot of inefficient health benefit packages out there. Okay. All right, I think we'll come back to that one at the end, because we might have some people in the audience who've even used the WHO choice approach, so that'd be interesting. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> is uh, Borha. So now we're going what? from the world, WHO, specifically to Spain. Well, thank you for being here. I will tell you a nice story from Spain. In Spain, there is a royal decree law that has said that a funding decision should be based on economic evaluation. But the problem is that so far, in Spain, we have, made, we have made decision looking at the figure of 30 thousand euros per life year gain, which is based on recommendation of a systematic review of recommendation and uh, in scientific journals. And also, what well, neither I say this figure is not formally adopted by law. Well, that's why three years ago we started up a project. And uh, the first step of this project, we carry out a systematic review of international evidence. Then we carry out a critical appraisal for the Spanish case. And now I'm just presenting one of the empirical studies. Well, the thing is, <laughs> under the fit budget, the CF vessel should be based on the opportunity cost of this investment requires this investment to adopt a new technology. In other words, the new technology should yield more health benefits than the health loss by shifting other, otherwise other system service. In econometric language, as to estimate the causal effect of health expenditure on health benefits. Well, what we did in Spain, we collect data from the 17 regions in Spain during the period of 2008 till 2013. As health variable, we collect life expectancy and then quality of life information based on EUQ, EQ5D. The problem here is that we had just information from 2012. What we did is to predict the quality of life for the rest of years. 
That's why we build up the quality of just, of just life expectancy. Then we also collect health expenditure data in euros per capita. And the important thing here is that this, in Spain, the central government allocates budget to region, and then they decide which is the amount uh, spent in health. This is important too. I will be back to this idea later. And also we, we collect demographic and socioeconomic variables of we called needs variable by, by region and by year. Then we estimate uh, regression models. Mainly we regress in front of the health benefit to health expenditure lacked by one year. And we also consider other demographic and socioeconomic uh, socio variables to control for. The main problem here is that we have an indigenity problem. This means that regions historically with more health need will spend more. So to try to solve this, what we did was to estimate by all this fixed effect, controlling for those that those needs variable I, I told you before. And the other approach was to try to use instrumental variable. We used the percentage of health expenditure on GDP, and just recently we add the labor cost and the price per fall square meters. The two conditions to be a good instrument have to be uh, to relate be related to health expenditure that was proof, and also to not affect affecting health benefit in other way from the health expenditure. So the second condition is not still proof, but we will assume from, from, from now that we, are, we have valid instrument, but what we'll do, we'll do. After we test uh, among the two approaches, and uh, all this was preferred uh, against instruments of variable approach, but we will see the results just, uh, just ahead. Well, we have here the results. Just look, please, at the first line is the estimation for the pool data. We estimate, we calculate the marginal effect that means, which is meant if, if we increase one euro in health expenditure a person per year, leads to a quality increase of, in this case, 0.018 years, which is mean 0.65 days. In other words, if we invest 10 euros per person per year, we will have 6.5 quad. How we, we translate this information to cost per quality? Well, we just, uh, based on, uh, on Luxembourg, we assume that this house expenditure should be invested the lifetime. It means from the lax, uh, taking account the life expectancy. And we got a figure of probably 25 southern years. The other approach, well, we, the rest of the lines, we estimate by age group, and then we calculate a weighted average. And we got a figure roughly of 21 southern years. Then afterwards, we, well, we, 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 we carry out some sensitivity analysis. If we look at the second line, we sh you, you, you can compare the results between the OLS and the instrumental variables. That's so probably more or less the same, we say. And then uh, after, with the set control variable, we see how as long as we introduce the, uh, the uh, Sorry, the explanatory variables, we got, uh, we got elasticity significant at 5%. Finally, what uh, we just not allowing for lag effect or was not as expected significant. On um, the last one, we just we did not adjust for quality of life. Well, Limitation, the, well, a bit uh, evidence here is the quality of data was just for one year, so it was predicted. Then it's true that it, it, there is an uncertainty of the valid instrument, but I will tell you in, uh, some, as soon as possible that uh, what's matter with it. 
And it's true that the transformation for quality to quality assumes linearity. Uh, well, this is what we consider the, the main limitation of the study. Well, at conclusions, we just say this is a proxy. We leave better with threshold than without threshold. That's the idea. We recommend to use the a range between the two approach, between 21, 20, 25, 24, a thousand euros per, per quality. This is true that it's not the unique criteria, it's just a hub. And uh, this should uh, be frequently adapted cause because health expenditure and health benefits change uh, across and over the period, across regions or over the period. Well, I start from Spain and I finish in France. This is a kind of sea threshold war. And uh, we hope to start up the, a similar project in France from this year, from next year. And just thank you for being here and welcome and suggesting now. <laughs> thank you. Do we have any uh, quick questions? Yep. Can you shout, Scott? Yes. I know. Have you tried to separately estimate the effect of cost on white years? Life, li life inspection sheet, just? just life inspection. Yeah, we did it. The last line. I can't see it actually. <laughs> the last line, sorry. It's, uh, we, 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 got, uh, we got the cost per quality higher than the adjusted for quality of life. It is roughly 66, but it's what's not significant in the health expenditure. Beta. You're welcome. Is, it a, is this going to be an ongoing comedy routine? Is it a question? <laughs> it can be a question. I'd love it to be a question, Carl. Or do you want to save it to the end? Okay, great. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. Right, thank you. So now we have Ashley who's going to be talking to us about uh, um, cost per deli thresholds. All right, great. So I'll be talking about cost effectiveness thresholds and cost per DALI studies, and I'll be looking at implications for research and policy. So I'd first like to acknowledge my co-authors and collaborators, which are David Kim, Josh Cohen, and Peter Newman from Tufts. And this project was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So firstly, why do we care about cost effectiveness thresholds? Why do they really matter? So because an ICER can be thought of as the price at which an intervention produces health gains, that price must be compared to a benchmark or a threshold value. And this benchmark represents what society is willing to pay for health gains, and in return, what goods and services we would be willing to forego for these gains. So anything above the benchmark would be not considered cost effective, or in other words, um, it isn't good value for the money spent. And then anything below the benchmark would be considered cost effective, or in other words, averting each disability adjusted life year at a lower cost. So a threshold assumed value is really important because it ultimately determines how society should invest in care, which then ultimately impacts overall population health. So for an example, say there's a new HIV medication on the market, and we're going to compare it to the standard of care drug currently in South Africa. So we found that this new medication would advert 5,000 disability-adjusted life years compared to the current medication in place in the South African setting. Is this new medication cost-effective, and how do we know? So when we look at the threshold cited in the current literature and past literature, one threshold cited has been $50 to $200 per DALI averted, 
which refers to the cost-effectiveness benchmark established by the World Bank's 1993 World Development Report. And if we use this threshold to determine the cost-effectiveness of this new HIV medication that we're looking at, the new medication would not be considered cost-effective. It's way, be up, way beyond the World Bank's World Development Report threshold value. So on the other hand, another threshold that has been cited in the literature and continues to be cited today has been the one to three times a country's per capita GDP, which was recognized in the past by the World Health Organization, which Melanie talked about, though the thinking behind this threshold has evolved, which we all know. However, if we use this threshold to determine the cost effectiveness of this new HIV medication that we're looking at, the new medication in South Africa would be considered both cost-effective and highly cost-effective according to this approach. So it's below the three times per capita GDP of the country and it's below the one times per capita GDP of the country. So this example just highlights the importance of thresholds in decision-making. So if we change the threshold, it will change our decision-making. So, for this study, we had two objectives, and the first object objective was to determine what thresholds are most often cited in the literature, and whether this trend has changed over time. So for this objective, we used the Tufts Medical Center Global Health Cost Effectiveness Analyses Registry to review all costs for DALI studies over the past 15 years, to really determine what thresholds analysts have been using. And the repository is publicly available. It's funded by the Gates Foundation, and it can be accessed through this site. And it includes all English language cost per DALI studies indexed in PubMed. And we included all catalog studies published from 2000 to 2015. And we also categorized thresholds used per study. So our review identified 479 costs per DALI studies in total that also collectively reported 3,859 costs per DALI ratios in total. So to look at the trend in costs per DALI studies over the past 15 years, we looked at the number of costs per DALI studies on the vertical axis by the publication year, which is on the horizontal axis. And we found that since the year 2000, the number of costs per DALI studies published each year has increased substantially, from five studies in the year 2000 to 85 studies in the year 2015. So in terms of specific thresholds mentioned among all reviewed studies over the past 15 years, the most commonly reported threshold value was this threshold of one to three times a country's GDP representing 57% of total studies that invoked only this threshold. And studies focused on low and middle income countries made up the greatest portion of studies citing this threshold, which represented 92% of this category. Additionally, 22% of all studies since 2000 didn't use any threshold at all. So since we're really interested in these trends over time, however, we looked at the percentage of studies citing specific thresholds, which is on the vertical axis, by the publication year, which is on the horizontal axis. And the proportion of studies citing this threshold of one to three times per capita GDP increased over time, with 0% of studies citing this threshold in the year 2000, 25% citing this threshold in the year 2002, and 72% by 2015. At the same time, the proportion citing the 1993 World Development Report threshold of $50 to $200 per DALI averted declined over time, with 40% of studies in 2000 citing this threshold to 0% in 2015. Likewise, Studies that mentioned no threshold at all also decreased over time, with 60% of studies citing no threshold in 2000, and this figure dipping below 20% in 2015.
So for our second objective, we wanted to assess whether the studies mentioning this widely used threshold of one to three times per capita GDP justify the reasoning behind using this threshold. So for this objective, we employed a more qualitative approach in this. So we randomly selected 20% of studies that used the one to three times per capita GDP and reviewed their text to determine if they provided any rationale for using this threshold within their particular contexts. So we found that none of these papers actually justified why these values made sense in their particular, particular countries that they were studying beyond just citing the literature that suggests these threshold values. So we think that analysts should really therefore be more thoughtful about what the threshold represents in certain contexts, rather than simply justifying their use through a citation. But this finding is also unsurprising, given that the WHO also did not provide a clear rationale for setting the standard to begin with. To look back briefly at the origins of this still widely used threshold, the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, which was later adopted by the World Health Organization for promoting cost effectiveness analyses, used the one to three times per capita GDP as just a rough estimate to gauge the economic loss resulting from certain diseases across countries. It's also consistent with the idea that people living in countries with higher incomes are able and willing to pay more for health care, and which that obviously makes intuitive sense. However, the Commission did not aim to set the threshold criterion for cost effectiveness analyses, and really intended it to be a rough estimate for economic loss. So although this threshold range roughly corresponds to what has become convention in higher income countries such as the US, per capita consumption in wealthier, wealthier countries exceeds the per capita consumption in low and middle income countries by one to two orders of magnitude. So therefore, extrapolation, extrapolation to low and middle income countries may not be valid. And thus, some analysts have argued that healthcare spending should represent a smaller portion of per capita GDP in low and middle income countries. And analysts have argued, for instance, that the threshold value really should be lower for these countries based on a healthcare budget perspective. So instead of relying on these generic global benchmarks, we argue that the global health economics field should develop context-specific thresholds corresponding to opportunity cost. And appreciating that there's no one-size-fits-all approach and that there's actually a spectrum between fixed versus non-fixed healthcare budgets, with many systems, most systems having a mix of both. In situations in which the healthcare budget is fixed, such as the NHS in the UK, the opportunity cost is the health loss resulting from cuts to displaced healthcare. In situations, on the other hand, in which the healthcare budget is not fixed or where individuals are purchasing health insurance in private markets, which is often what we see in the United States, the opportunity cost is the non-healthcare consumption that is lost due to the added investments in healthcare. So there's still an opportunity cost there. So what's next and what do we do with this information? So one to three times per capita GDP has played a larger role in recent years, with analysts continuing to cite and use this threshold for cost-effectiveness analyses. Not only does this threshold approach lack a clear foundation, but it also doesn't take into account local context, including budget constraints and feasibility. Secondly, cost-effectiveness analyses is a really important tool that can inform healthcare spending but its value really depends on assumptions that should reflect local contexts. And in terms of implications for future research, we think that key international agencies should re-examine the use of global cost effectiveness thresholds. And analysts should be more thoughtful about what the threshold represents, and in return, provide evidence on either opportunity costs or preference data in supporting their decision. Thank you. Thanks very much.
much, actually. Uh, questions? Are you sure? Okay. This one, this one genuinely is a question. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed that. It, the question was about your characterisation of uh, opportunity costs in different types of healthcare system. One mm. that's budget constrained where opportunity costs fall pretty much entirely on health, although not entirely, and a private insurance based one. And you characterised it as if in that context health opportunity costs are the consumption losses of those who are having to pay more for their insurance premiums. But that's not quite true. Health, increased healthcare costs, even in a US-like system, increasing the cost of premiums, employers reducing benefits packages, people not being able to afford insurance and ending up being uninsured or underinsured, or if they do have a package, because it's more costly, they face high co-payments and high deductibles, so when they need care, they can no longer access it. So healthcare costs, even in a United States-type system, has health consequences, and in principle, we can estimate that. The only time we would dismiss those health consequences, which do exist, is if you believe that markets are perfect and signal social value, and I would object to both of those propositions. The idea that healthcare markets are perfect markets and that consumers are fully informed in making their choices so that those that lose healthcare lose it because it's less valuable than those that gain it is something I reject both on empirical grounds and normative ones. Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> no, no. That was a question, come on. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, that's a really good point. You can answer something in there, go for it, Ashley. Okay, thanks. No, that's a really good point. I think that we were just saying that um, there still is an opportunity cost. It might not be the same opportunity cost from a healthcare budget perspective, but there still is an opportunity cost um, from an outside consumption perspective when we're paying more for healthcare. Um, that we believe is actually more valuable than we're going to give up something else um, outside of the healthcare budget, say, I mean, anything that we consume on a normal basis. So I think that's really, but yeah, that, that's definitely a good point. Thanks. Any other quick questions before we move on? No, okay, thanks very much, Ashley. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you everyone for um, staying till the end. And I would also like to thank the IHE organisers for convening this interesting session and for accepting my presentation. So my talk today is on a piece of work with Tony Harris and Karen Yong from the Centre of Health Economics at Monash University. And it's on bargaining power and public insurance coverage for drugs in Australia, a duration analysis. So I'd like to start with some context. Australia has a national pharmaceutical benefit scheme that subsidises the cost of medicines for all Australians. To get listed on the PBS, sponsors of pharmaceuticals would make submissions for coverage to the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, which is an independent statutory body. The PBAC reviews and makes recommendations to the Minister for Health, who cannot list a drug on the PBS unless the PBAC delivers a positive recommendation. And since 1993, um, all submissions are, it's mandatory for all submissions to be accompanied by an economic evaluation. So in the Australian system, resubmissions are permitted without limits, and if a drug is rejected at any meeting, they, the sponsor can choose to resubmit by changing the price, lowering the price, or changing parameters of effectiveness, or amend the population of coverage. And the PBS has grown significantly over the years from its inception in 1948 of just 139 life-saving drugs at a cost around 300,000 Australian dollars to greater than 900 drugs um, exceeding $10 billion um, per annum in 2016. So decisions by the PBAC are always closely scrutinised by the media and interest groups, particularly if the drug was rejected. Um, and in recent times, there has also been criticism that the listing process is taking too long. So flashing across the screen now are just some of these media headlines. So the motivation for this paper is to understand the listing process, why some drugs are listed and others are not, 
and what factors drive these decisions. And we also want to understand how long it would take um, a drug to get listed in a system where, um, which allows unlimited attempts. So there's a large body of literature that already confirms a range of factors influence the drug funding decision from by fitting largely binary choice models, um, previous work including work by Nancy Devlin and Dave Parkin and more recently by Dakin um, et al on NICE decisions and also PBAC decisions by George et al and Harris et al um, suggest that uncertainty in the evidence, the ISA, the incremental cost and effective ratio, sorry, um, budget impact, clinical efficacy and disease severity um, are all important factors. However, these analyses, including um, our own previous work, ultimately do not fully characterise the drug listing process. Since all previous analyses had looked at the likelihood of individual submissions being recommended for listing and did not consider the time it took to obtain those recommendations. And also the factors for um, the factors um, to explain the listing decision were also not based on any theoretical framework and were chosen rather ad hoc or based on some general notion that they should be considered. So in this paper, we would like to advance um, current literature and propose that the funding decision should be considered as an outcome of, the bar of a bargaining process between the funder and the manufacturer, especially where multiple submissions is a feature. And you know, despite the centrality of this bargaining process to the pharmaceutical coverage, it has largely been ignored in empirical literature to date. So let me start by explaining the informal bargaining model. Um, the classic bargaining game theory analysed by Nash asks what we would expect in a general situation of bargaining over the distribution of the value of a good between two players. For example, illustrated here, the government and the industry, um, here shown trying to divvy up the giant pie um, representing the value of the drug. So both want to reach an, an agreement, but each of them attaches a different value to each possible outcome. There are many, many solutions, different prices representing different incremental cost effective ratios, or cost per quality, and different volumes of sales um, representing different budget impacts. In the Nash solution, um, the final distribution would depend on the shape of the value function of each player and the consequences of no agreement being reached. For example, it seems likely that a government, in deciding whether to fund a drug or not, uh, would be more concerned with the possibility of funding an ineffective and costly drug than the equivalent gain from funding an, an effective and less costly drug. So if this is the case, you can probably describe the funder as being drug, uh, by being risk averse. The more risk averse one party is, the lower their resulting share of the bargaining. A risk, of fund, a risk averse funder is, for example, more likely to reject a proposal with more uncertain quality of evidence or a higher potential for financial risk. In addition, theories of bargaining following Rothstein um, suggest that the more impatient the player, the less their bargaining power and the lower their final share. This would imply an earlier acceptance of a higher price if the government was under some pressure to fund a drug, for example, because there are very ill patients waiting for life-saving treatments. Or the company might be willing to accept a lower price and a more restricted population if it was under time pressure to return a profit for their shareholders, or that it knows a competitor with a similar or better offer is coming. A competitor or an alternative offer or alternative effective treatment, on the flip side, would also be an outside option for the government increasing its bargaining power. So the government and the industry go about in this bargaining process via the submissions. In addition, at any time, the greater the public pressure to fund a new drug, the less the bargaining power for the government, since the political consequences of you know, failing to reach an agreement on price and coverage are greater. This may be because there are very vocal patient interest groups. In Australia, many patient groups are actually, such as the Cancer Alliance, are actually funded by the industry. And the public is also influenced by media reports and patient impact stories. In fact, it's not uncommon to see a surge in media reports leading up to PBAC decisions. Um, politicians may also be compelled to influence decisions um, to gain more votes when there is greater public interest. So all of this would form a ring of 
pressure on the decision maker. So failure to reach an agreement on price and indication might have even more political consequences for the government if there are no effective alternative drugs for treatment of serious conditions. While for companies, striking a bargain at a price substantially lower than their global levels um, may be worse than no bargain at all if it's going to affect their prices elsewhere. So to summarise, based on our bargaining model, we would expect higher opportunity costs of funding and uncertainty with the evidence will have negative impacts on the funding decision, whereas severity of disease and whether a drug has the potential to deliver significant improvements um, over existing therapies, high levels of public interest, and whether the drug produces clinically significant effects would positively be associated with likelihood of funding. The higher the ISA, um, as the proposed price that determines the share of the surplus going to the government, would also be negatively associated with the likelihood of funding. Okay, so to test this hypothesis, we constructed a data set of PBAC funding decisions um, between 19, uh, no, sorry, pardon me, between July 2005 and November 2012, so just over seven years of data, data on evidence presented and what the committee thought of the evidence were double extracted from PBAC meeting um, records following a predefined template. There were 624 submissions in total, but our analysis was limited to 298 submissions that reported a cost per quality outcome. Um, in our analysis, each unique drug and indication pair was considered to be a separate subject, so that if a drug has two different indications, they'll be considered a separate subject in our data set. So overall analysis included 192 subjects. To inform whether the drug um, was for treatment of a severe disease and whether it has the potential to substantially improve, uh, make, had to uh, bring about substantial improvements over existing therapies, we decided to base our ratings on the FDA classifications for drugs um, for expedited reviews. We considered all drugs that were FDA fast track reviewed, breakthrough therapy or a salad review as fitting um, our definitions. So to quantify for the level of Oh, pardon me, for the level of public interest on the drug, as a proxy for the level of um, pressure on the committee, we extracted data from Google Trends for each drug. This was as measured as the average change in Google Trends in the year, well, the Google Trends, which gives an indication of the volume searches for a particular drug on Google in the year leading up to the meeting. This was then standardised across all drugs by working out the difference versus the health category. So the hypothesis is if there was a surge in Google Trends data, um, it would represent a surge in public interest in the drug in the year leading up to the decision. Okay, so our outcome of interest is time to positive recommendation by the PBAC from the subject's first submission. We used a time varying Cox proportional hazards model um, as our statistical model. The Cox model has the advantage of being less restrictive than parametric models as it estimates the effects of our bargaining variables on the hazard rate of listing without having to pre-specify pre -specify the shape of the underlying hazard function. Subjects not listed by the end of our observation period, um, being November 2012, were censored at that point. Meetings are generally held um, three times a year um, for the PBAC with an occasional outer session meeting. So we use an Efron method for ties as we expect some tied survival times. Okay, so I'd like to quickly run through the results, um, but I would like to say, since we're still working on the paper, these are still work in progress. So in our data set, there were 298 submissions um, with 192 unique drug indication pairs. The median number of submissions per subject was 1.55 times, um, even though only 33% or cost per quality submissions were recommended, um, considering by subject, 52% of subjects were actually listed during the follow-up period the median time to recommendation was 1.33 years or approximately 16 months. Um, here are the results from our Cox model. We, the results of all covariates are significant at the 10% level with direction effect matching our, um, our hypothesis. So hazard ratios greater than one indicates the covariate positively influences time to, uh, the like, sorry, the likelihood of recommendation per unit change um, in a continuous variable or by set amount for a binary variable. As hypothesised, uncertainties with the clinical and economic evidence were found to be associated with lower likelihood of receiving a positive recommendation from the PBAC, as do higher ICES, 
and higher budget um, impacts, which are consistent with situations where the pharmaceutical company has a lower bargaining power. Whereas the rarity disease and the drug um, with and a drug with the potential to deliver substantial um, improvement over existing therapies, higher levels of public interest, and whether the drug produces a clinical significant effects are positively associated with likelihood of funding, indicating a stronger bargaining power. Whoops, Paul is standing up, not good. Uh, <laughs> sorry, just um, two, more, two more slides. Um, so of interest, our result um, is also one of the first studies that quantifies the relationship between public pressure and as measured by Google Trends and the likelihood of recommendations. So I'd just like to quickly explore that. Uh, I know I haven't got any time left, but just to quickly explore that um, further. In this graph, you can see in a scenario for drugs um, with an uncertain clinical data, a surge in public interest measured by Google, in, uh, increase in Google Trends in the le year leading up to the decision, improved the median time to um, recommendation at any ISA, which is represented on horizontal axes. At an ISA of 50,000K, the median time to recommendation went from 1.66 years to 1.33 years if you double um, the search activity or 0.67 years if you quadruple the search activity. All right, um, so there are obviously limitations, sorry, our model is, um, yeah, obviously it doesn't include supply side um, things such as not the number of competitors and prices and we are also running some additional sensitivity analysis. Um, and that's the conclusion. So our conclusion is our bargaining model is confirmed using Australian data and bargaining power is an important determinant of... Um, <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Okay, we any quick questions for Jing Jing before we um, hold it open to the, the greater floor? No? Okay, so I, I think what we'll do now is we'll open it up so my title was a question. Are you listening, Carl? <laughs> it's cost effectiveness thresholds. Where are we now? So it starts with a W and ends with a question mark. <laughs> and I wondered if uh, anybody thought that we were anywhere different from where we started from about an hour and a half ago. If anybody's learned anything, if anyone wants to make any reflections, anybody's tried to either estimate cost effectiveness thresholds um, or has anything about trying to use thresholds, even trying to explain thresholds, I guess, um, to, to decision makers, to try and understand decision makers' thresholds. We just wanted to open it up and quickly say your name and, and where you're from. Um, I, I'm gonna um, offer something out that hasn't been talked about before. We've done an amazing job in the hospital sector. We know um, after the work at Yale in 1970s, we've come to using economic theory to find minimum average cost for the cost of a hospital stay. And we risk adjust that hospital stay um, according to institution and a cost according to diagnoses and various other factors as well. And it's been adopted in other countries as well. We have HRGs in, in, in Britain and various other things. What precludes us from giving prescribing budgets to physicians on the supply side for, let's say, taking care of, of antihypertensives for hypertensives uh, for the month? And they make a choice um, among their hypertensives. Some get this drug, some get that drug, and they give the voucher to that, that you know, patient to go to the pharmacy for that particular drug, and the physician has to make a, a, a trade-off between they make a loss uh, on their average uh, because there's a willingness to pay that society has decided, rather than making a decision uh, on these these crazy ideas that we have about thresholds and do away with them. Let let the market sort of. Uh, sort it all out. Um, the drug companies will have to respond to the fact that there are drug budgets in certain countries where that is is, is um, uh, constructed that way. I wanted to throw that out there as, a, as an alternative idea for how to deal with this in a sort of more economically rigorous way. I don't know if any of our speakers want to take it. I'm, I'm reluctant to let Carl take it. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, from uh, living in a, in, a, in a health system that doesn't have a market, when we tried a market in that sense, which was GP fund holding in the UK, you know, it didn't work that well. And so I guess it's partly the market, the fact that we don't live in a market, but everybody clearly wants... Do you want to answer that question or are you going to make a comment? I feel like I somehow have to manage you, Carl, but I don't know why. <laughs> Um, if you think that the market can solve social choice in healthcare, all I'd ask you to do is to just look around this country and see where it leads you. 
Um, you still have rationing. You still have rationing. But you ration on the basis of those that can't afford decent health insurance, and you ration on the basis of those that can't afford the co-pays and the deductibles. You know, the US healthcare system, you spend trillions and you get really poor outcomes. So, you know, we learned a lesson. The market is not the way to make uh, accountable, evidence-based choices about healthcare, because those choices about healthcare are not individual choices. They have an impact on all of us because we all end up paying for healthcare. We pay for it in a market system through higher co-pays. What, what I wanted to say is this, and it is, it is a question, is it not a fact that those groups, research groups that are now working in this field, trying to estimate health opportunity costs for different healthcare systems are indeed the happy few, a band of brothers and sisters. <laughs> that uh, that, uh, and those that are not engaged in that will feel themselves accursed and hold their manhood cheap. They were not there to fight with us on St. Crispin's Day. Now, I don't know what St. Crispin's Day was, but it's a bloody good speech from Shakespeare, and that's exactly the way it is right now. What has happened at this meeting? Yesterday, we saw the research for the UK, uh, James Lomas reported that. We've just seen the work from Spain, the excellent work from Spain. Yesterday, we saw the excellent work from South Africa. Yesterday, at a session, we saw the two groups working in, in, in the Netherlands. One of them presented yesterday where, 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 where they are with that. We see that France is moving to, to do the same thing. Um, Canada, uh, the same thing, just about to start off in Alberta. Um, you know, we, I mean, it's kind of endless. Norway has adopted estimates, the Norwegian government, whilst they are uh, estimating their own values. We've got values of for 123 countries, low and middle income countries based on cross country data. But we've also got groups as well as South Africa working in Indonesia. We've got groups working um, uh, in India, estimating it for the states. So, you know what, this is, this is a time to actually estimate what we really need to know. And we need to do it for the mother load. The mother load is the United States. We need to do it for the United States, not just the consumption opportunity costs, but the health opportunity costs in the United States. And when we do that, Melanie's absolutely right. That isn't the magic bullet to fix the system because there's a lot of inefficiencies in the system and it's not low income countries who have a monopoly on inefficiency. Actually, the mother load of inefficiency is the United States because of the incentives for massive seek rent seeking behavior that's rife throughout the system. And when it comes to pressure, when it comes to pressure, the way to relieve the pressure is to estimate this stuff. That is the way to relieve it. Because as soon as we start to understand health opportunity costs, then the real strong ethical foundations of cost effectiveness analysis as a means of informing social choices becomes abundantly clear. And we have a prospect of healthcare decisions that are accountable to reason, evidence, and widely held social value. Okay, Carl, so I know where we've got to get to, because you're, you're quite adamant about that. So why isn't it being widely adopted? And how do we, how do we change what decision makers are doing? Is that a question? I mean, so that's a question to anybody who wants to, up to take it up. I mean, so great, we, we do this in the US, but is it going to change the way that people make decisions? Uh, uh, John Goss, University of Canberra. Uh, I mean, I think the, the reason it's not being adopted is obvious. It's the, it's the golden rule. Um, he who has the gold rules. And there is obviously not an incentive in, in, in the ruling class to, um, to actually have this proper work done everywhere. The Department of Health in the UK has adopted £15,000 per quality for all their impact assessments. It's the basis on which our entire civil service figures out the health consequences of healthcare costs. NICE might not have responded, but that's a problem for NICE. How do we start to put pressure? Well, I own the website nicebodycount.org. Uh, I bought it with my own money because to get my university to pay for that would have required far too much paperwork. I also own the website donorbodycount.org to keep track of the health opportunity costs of donors that put unwarranted restrictions on their assistance. So I think, I'm not saying that's the way to go through that kind of advocacy, but I do think the world is shifting. The Norwegian government has adopted a threshold that is basically 
the UK estimate changed by purchasing power parity. As for the United States, there's only one way to fix the United States, so apart from a radical change with Bernie Sanders becoming president. There's only one way to fix it, and that is to start to target to inform uh, US citizens at planned choice. The idea that by trying to persuade clinicians who are part of the problem, because just, you know, follow the money, it's clinicians, the only way, is, I, in my view, is to start to help American citizens make informed planned choices with understanding health opportunity costs. Afshin Ganjua, Frankfurt School of Finance and Management, Germany. So I have a following question on the IV estimates. This relates to your research as well as the research of the York Group. So what you estimate is the marginal productivity, right? So if you displace a marginal service, what is the health loss? So you measure opportunity costs in terms of the marginal service displaced. But how do you know that the marginal service is displaced and not the average service? Because if you don't know which service is replaced, isn't it a better assumption to assume that the average service is displaced? Yeah, um, Adrian Towers, I just wanted to make a couple of comments on the, the session yesterday, which is, as Carl said, was very, very good. Um, first one is on, on Carl's paper. So James Lomas did an excellent presentation of the econometrics around getting from the um, program budget expenditure by category um, using the mortality data, to, which gets you effectively to a cost per life, life year gained or life year averted, depend, I can't remember the exact terminology. The critical issue for me are the assumptions you then use in order to get to cost per quality which are incredibly important, and James didn't, didn't have a chance to go into those. So those, for me, are the, are the critical issue. And, you get, and the critical issue around decision-maker acceptability, in part, is the element of uncertainty that's involved in this. So, as Carl said, it's true, the, UK, the Department of Health in the UK has adopted 15,000, but NHS England hasn't. There's no instruction to local commissioners that they shouldn't be spending more than 15,000 a quality on what they buy locally. So I think we have to recognize that, you know, that there's a movement, but one of the issues, and I agree fundamentally, and so that the papers today presented it very starkly, as indeed did the papers yesterday. But let's not fool ourselves that, as well as people who just don't want to use this full stop, there's also a, a genuine issue around the uncertainty involved in making these estimates and how we tackle that and deal with that. And I just wanted to pick up another point from the presentations yesterday, which Carl picked up on, was, was an excellent presentation by David Vaness on what is the opportunity cost in the US in terms of people having to give up their insurance policy or incur higher co-pays. And I mean, the, the numbers that he came out with were his median cost per quality was around $84,000, and his mean cost per quality was just under $100,000. So. So, but it, the interesting thing was just as a concept for me, I found it an interesting way of, of thinking about this and, 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 and Carl rightly um, picked up on that. But, um, and it's interesting to see already huge amount of uncertainty. He stressed he'd done the work extremely quickly, lots of uncertainty. But again, the implication is we can actually get at these numbers, but we have to recognize that we are having to make a lot of assumptions and we need to be clear about those assumptions. just wanted to step back a couple of comments and agree with Carl that the health market hasn't worked in its style in the US very well. Um, someone asked why we don't have thresholds, why countries haven't done this. And I think that I, I can't answer why not, but I can say that what we are observing is that the citizen's voice is growing exponentially in Africa, in Asia, in South America. and there is going to be a growing demand for rationalisation of the, the decisions that are made in benefit packages. So whether we have a threshold or don't have a threshold, whether we have an explicit benefit package or not, there's rationing that goes on. And being clear about how the choices have been made is the only way to get the citizens to agree to the process that's going on. So, you know, WHO has a new framework for engagement with non-state actors in recognising that we have to get better at dealing with citizen voice associations. And I would say health economists as a whole need to get better at talking to people, talking to patient advocacy groups and understanding 
you know, the needs of the people. And I think over the next 10 years, that's going to be a huge growth area um, and something that is pretty key to achieving the sustainable development goals is getting the buy-in of the population. Is I want to get back to the question of why um, these cost effectiveness thresholds and their use haven't necessarily been adopted in low and middle income countries. And I think part of that was because until recently there weren't empirical estimates um, of what those health opportunity costs were for those countries, um, but also because the advice has varied so much um, from what was advised by WHO um, to what universities were coming out with. And I think we're finally starting to converge on the advice that we're giving, which is really a good thing. Um, it gives country decision makers sort of a starting point, uh, but as well, there haven't um, been methods uh, to use these estimates of health opportunity costs in developing benefits packages. So countries have done this in a sort of ad hoc fashion, really, and uh, as a result of that, um, there tends to still be a lot of implicit rationing, and these methods really aren't very well developed yet. So that's something that I'm working on with um, colleagues, Carl and others at the University of York, um, which was presented Sunday morning, feels like forever ago, um, on how to sort of use these estimates in order to be able to quantify like the different trade-offs um, that occur when we have other objectives uh, in addition to health, so things like equity, um, and being able to look at the health losses that result from having these additional objectives uh, enables decision makers to transparently um, say sort of why they're making these decisions and also to look at uh, the constraints, like Carl said, that are imposed by donor funding um, and different things like that. Thanks. Okay, well, I'm, I'm surprised. We've actually gone over time. So um, we've all now got to rush uh, to get changed, make ourselves pretty for the gala. I think there'll be lots of conversations to continue tonight and tomorrow. Um, thank you um, for participating. I'd like you to come, welcome, welcome, like you to join me in thanking the presenters as well. Thank you. Thank you.